I want to thank Holger for inviting me to come to Regensburg again. It's always a pleasure to be here in Germany. I uh, love this country. My patient care coordinator is actually German. I, joking, I jokingly said with, to him that I get texts from her in German thinking I actually speak German, and I, my usual response is a big question mark. Um, but I'm very happy to be here today. Answer to Jonathan's question about what I do. I centrifuge, but I honestly don't think it really matters. There are so many ways to skin a cat, so many ways to get good results. I trained in Japan. Um, for uh, some fat grafting as well, and uh, my physician mentor there has been doing fat washing for probably 25 years now and getting excellent long-term 10, 15-year follow-up results. So um, on that note, I think what I'm going to be focusing on today is a little bit more about philosophical approach, because you're going to see plenty of technique from me, both in terms of uh, a, a procedure that I'll do tomorrow morning, um, with Holger and as well as uh, some cadaver work that you'll get your hands wet and, and be able to do that. So I think it's very important when we start is to really begin to understand what is aging. Now we've heard a lot about it through all different types of approaches so this will be somewhat redundant but at the same time will also be hopefully philosophically good and you can take a few gems out of it. So if you look at aging you can clearly see in this photograph uh, there's progression with wrinkles, maybe some some sagging, but if you look, especially periorbally, there's a complete deflation where that brow is full. So I encourage you to go back, and if you have a question, especially as you start to develop your aesthetic, is go back and look at your patient's old photographs, because you're going to be challenged and say, wow, I get it, maybe I don't need a brow lift. Maybe if I do a blepharoplasty, it's going to be more of a conservative nature, and you're going to start to develop an eye of what is youthful. And I always say consult some very good textbooks. They're called Glamour, Allure, and Vogue because these magazines have youthful females in them, and that is what's natural. What is not natural is just an arbitrary decision to lift. An example here is if you look at Sharon Stone over a 20-year time gap, the natural inclina inclination, if you only look at the image on the left, is that she's got a gravitational component to the upper eyelid. You can see dermatocolasis, you can see browtosis. But if you look very carefully at her right, which would be your left, you could see that her brow has marginally decreased uh, in terms of vertical height, and her upper eyelid has come down a little bit. Now look at the other side. There's actually been a retraction upward. The brow's actually gone up a bit, and the upper eyelid has actually retracted up a couple millimeters. So the net difference is that exposure of the orbital rim, the fullness that's around that area. But clearly I think you see, fortunately at this meeting, no, but a lot of times at some of these American meetings, an over-exuberant desire for volume. We're not going to talk about a lot of volume today. We're going to talk about a very judicious use of it so that you're, it's more attractive. And so this is going to be sort of a, a two-part talk. Today is going to be on fat grafting and tomorrow is on fillers. So you have a two ways of philosophically approaching a patient, and if you can sort of marry some of these concepts that I'll be talking about today with some of the ones I'll be talking about tomorrow, maybe there's going to be a happy medium of how to approach a patient. So we're not talking about excessive volume. We're talking about covering shadows and understanding shape. So I like to use terminology and ways to express to patients in an easy fashion because you heard communication is everything. And that is a great video, by the way. I love that video. Um, so too full is not necessarily the ideal. It's it, a perfect ideal is enough volume. And the enough volume is placed in all the right places. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you look at people with their metabolically stable weight, basically what you're seeing is a linear loss of fat from birth to death. That's all it is. If you think of a one-year-old, a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 20-year-old, and ongoing. And that is really what you, you see. And so we're going to talk about that volume loss being a linear deficit, just going straight down until someone, if they have the same weight at 80, is generally very, very emaciated in the face. This concept is so critical because oftentimes what we do is we so focus on the technique. So we take a lot of technique notes, but we don't step back and use our right brain, which is, does a person actually look better? And that blink concept is when I look at a patient, when I'm judging my own work, I actually blur out the face for a moment, and I go by a gut, does the person look more attractive? If they don't, and they just have a, a better jawline and a higher brow and a, an obliterated nasolabial groove, what is the actual reason we're doing this? And my question to my patients to discern whether I've succeeded or not is how, not how happy are you. I say, how many compliments have you received? 
And that means how have other people judge you? Because a lot of times, women in particular look really closely at the mirror. They're judging all the little micro flaws, but I have to take them out of that perspective. Because if you start looking at it from a microscopic level, I can't help you. I can't even see what you're talking about. And I have to reframe the thinking both for the patient and maybe for you as well. And my staff know when I'm happy when I tell a patient, man, you look great. And I usually say it 16 times. If I didn't say it 16 times, I still have some work to do. Uh, so I'm, I get excited about my work. So let's talk about facial shape, which you're going to hear more about tomorrow actually much more in detail tomorrow, but I'm gonna get some concepts um, for you. So we, in a blink of an eye, can pretty much judge someone's youth, right? From 20, 30 feet away. It's not the three inch mirror with, sorry, the three inches away with a 10X magnification. We know that youth from a very far distance. We can, we can tell, and we're gonna do a little uh, example in a moment. So that is a round shape in evolving to greater weight to the lower phase, either through metabolic slowdown, gravity, et cetera, but there's a facial shape that we know. So we're gonna, designing a shape is so, so, so very important to help uh, change that blink. And when we're at that 30 mark, really that's an oval, and that oval is really the desirous uh, concept. So if there's anything you remember out of this entire talk is ovalizing the face. I'll talk about some basic concepts now, but I'm gonna really, really get into ovalization tomorrow in, in the concept of fillers and understanding halo filling as sort of a, a, an idea of framing every element of the face with circles and, ha and ovals, a new concept I've come up with in the last year. So let's talk about ovalization because if you ask a lot of women who've passed 30, oftentimes they like their face more at 30 than they do at 20 because it's less round. They like it a little slimmer. In fact, the biggest fear patients have when I say I'm gonna put fat in your face is am I gonna look like chubby? And the goal is not to blow up the face, it's to manage shadows. I like to say I'm, I'm your makeup artist because what happens as you mature, when a woman tries to help cover things, what they do is they have to cover shadows and they improve highlights and improve shape. I say I'm your makeup artist because good fat grafting essentially is managing those shadows, improving the highlights, improving shape. So a lot of times when I show this next series of photos, people start getting into the wanting to memorize these numbers and they rapidly write these numbers down. These numbers have almost no meaning. You could change them, but my goal is to teach you how to see, not to try to memorize numbers. So these numbers are irrelevant. So what I'm showing you here in this lady is she's got a heavier set face. I did a little bit of rhinoplasty as well. But if you look, I brought some attention more to the central upper cheek to, and, and, and the upper face to make your brain not see the lower face. So it's, it's an architectural shift. Um, what I talk about is if there's a glass of water on a television screen and I say, how big is this glass of water? You say, I have no reference points. I don't know. But if I put a shot glass next to it, the first glass of water looks large. I didn't do anything to it. And if I put a pitcher of water next to it, the first one looks small. So these are relative size things. So when you're judging a face, what you want to do is not change their look, but improve and enhance them so they look more attractive. This is a half Asian face. And what you're seeing here is transitioning down. She doesn't have a too full of face, but I want to transition a little bit more and use a little more conservative volumes. When you use a little more conservative volumes, I think you're getting a nice soft result without being too aggressive. This lady is more volumetrically depleted. She is more skeletal. So I'm going to place more fat and I'm gonna place more in the transition zone. A huge component of this is not to get too exuberant with the anterior cheek and not to get too exuberant with just this central part because there's no transition going down. The buccal area is of critical importance so the transition points are improved. And this lady here, the, the same thing, I believe a lot of the problem is outer lower face so that that scalloping going down is really well blended. And here's another example where I think what you can do here is actually focus more on the outer face because the face here is rectilinear, it's long. And if you can bring the face into an ovalization uh, shape, which is that nice arc, then the face looks softer, more proportional, more illuminated and more balanced. Same thing here, the next one you're seeing that I'm actually even more aggressive towards some of that outer lower face and not the cheek so much. I've actually put almost more in that buckle zone because that's really where the problem is, is where you can fill a little bit outside in that region. 
And I believe that the more aggressive you get out in the buckle zone in the right patient, the more that harmony is. And again, start looking at shadow points. And could I improve this further? Yes, this was done a few years ago. I would today put more in the temple, put a little bit more under the arch of the bone, and soften it. But that's what I do with all my fat grafts. I say a fat graft is to get you to 80%. I'm not going to get you a, a flawless result. There is going to be a, some absorption. So the goal is improvement, changing the blink. If I don't change the blink, I've failed you. But if you think I'm going to make everything perfect, then I've also misled you. Because that's not the point of a fat graft. And here's probably a more extreme example, but just blending there. And as you see, these numbers are a bit variable. I may have put a little bit more in one or the other. Why did I put more in one or the other? I'm just trying to teach you how to see. Not so much worrying about exactly the quantities of milliliters I'm placing in. So let's talk about blink use an example. This is a lady that is about six years out from a fat graft. I, one of the few people I haven't done anything with fillers or, or even very little neuromodulator in that interim. And if you look at the smaller photograph, the, if she is the one on your right, her identical twin sister, both 42 obviously, she has never had anything done, not even neuromodulator, doesn't believe in doing anything. In this very small photograph, in a blink of an eye, you can see that my patient somehow in your brain, in your primitive brain, you say she looks more youthful. Why is that? Now, if you were pretending to work on her twin sister and had no reference to her sister, and you just said, this is the lady that has never had anything done, I want to work on her, she comes to your office, you may want to make her nasolabial groove softer, you may want to take a little of the hanging skin away, you may want to elevate the brows a little bit, obviously not too much, you may feel she's a little slack in the jawline, you may feel her lips are sl slightly attenuated and thin, but if you look at that, her brow is higher than her, the sister I worked on, maybe because she's lifting it that way. She has less hang on the eye. Her, her fold is about the same depth. Her lips are painted a little fuller. Her jawline is not necessarily worse, but it's the light and shadow that draws your brain to say an identical twin looks older than the sister I worked on. And if you look back when she was 32 as a model, you can see the blink is there. It may not look identical, but we're not trying to achieve parity. We're, we're trying to approximate one's own identity. And if you have any question or judgment, go back and look at the person's old photos. Don't use that as a benchmark, so otherwise it'll be misleading, but give them an impression of what we can do to improve. So the other thing is very important about light. All my photographs, believe it or not, are taken in the same room, same distance, same camera, no ambient light, not the same uh, photographer, all controlled with little buttons. You say, well, the lighting looks different. And the reason for this is that when you see a face that has more volume, they attract more light. My camera eats up more light. I'm going to tell you how I take these photos and why some, maybe one of the reasons why you cannot see your results is because of flash photography. Because sometimes we look like Nick Nolte on a bad night, right? You know, on a, on a bender. That's because if you think about what we have, is most of the time we have light on skin that's coming down. It is a down from this room, except for diffusion. I always say except for maybe some high-end changing room. But most of the time, we have top-down lighting. If we're outdoors, we have top-down lighting. And that, that lighting that's coming down is, when it's volumized, it bounces better. And so that's really what I want to encourage is to understand that bounce. When we have that beautiful bounce is what is what makes a face look better. So my room is a very small room. If you have a very large room with very dim lighting, you're gonna have too many shadows. You want a small room, same room, all the time, every photograph always taken in that room, uh, no exceptions, same distance, same camera, uh, with no flash when you're trying to show volume. Otherwise, you're not gonna see the difference because it's too washed out. Longevity is important because why do this if it's going to last three months? You have off-the-shelf sh options today. And I really believe fat is fantastic for long term with the caveat that we do progress in aging. So I was studying for the hair board about, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And I was looking at this and I just started to conceptualize, oh, I think the reason a lot of people overfill faces is that they stuff them and then they see them at two months and they fill them again and they fill them again and they fill them again because they're saying, you know what, I need to do six times. What they're not allowing time is for that fat to mature over, over a period of a year or two. So I ask you to do things. Take consistent photographs with no flash in a small room standardized and follow your patients before you start filling them again and again and again and again and again because you're going to have too much volume. 
And our goal in this volume talk is not volume, it's shadow reduction. So it's a different way to understand it. When you start to see shadows, you start to understand beauty uh, or the absence of it and how to correct it. So I see this very volumized fill face and it dips a bit and then people at that point say it's over. But you've got to give it time to mature. Watch that result over a period of time and you're going to see some changes. This is a lady that looks pretty full at a week and I tell my patients it's going to take you a few weeks to really love it. And then at a month, softer. And then at three months, maybe it's dipped a little bit. And at six months, maybe it's dipped a little further. And then 11 months, and I didn't do anything except neuromodulators over this period of time. And then over 15 months, maintain the weight. Only thing I do is neuromodulators. And if you watch your results, I encourage you, take standardized photography and watch it over time before you start to overinflate a patient. You can always do little temporary HA fillers, whatever it is, but don't push too fast. The biggest risk, if you are careful in your technique, and I'll show you what careful technique is in the, in the lab, the key is that what is the major risk of fat grafting? For me, the major risk is weight gain. And I live in Texas where it's the capital and one of the capitals in the world of weight gain. So the problem with this is what I've seen in my patients is gaining weight, okay? And if you gain weight, your face doesn't look right. How much weight? It depends on how big you are. If you're 90 pounds, you could gain five pounds. But if you're 130, 140, you probably need about 20 pounds before it starts to look weird. And I tell my patients, be careful with weight, number one thing. So I don't want fat to look better. I don't want need more take. I just want to get them good enough. And then if I need to do some small bioinert fillers, I can do that. I was speaking in Columbia many years ago, and I was saying this, and then a, a, a doctor said, oh my god, I wish I'd heard your talk, because I to totally filled the mandible with fat, and this lady over time has gotten bigger, because it's asymmetric. It's not a bioinert filler, very important to know that. So the key thing is that fat grafting is going to be variable. You get a good baseline. And why do it? Because it's cost effective, it's durable, and it looks good, but don't overfill. And always in my hands, what I tell my patients is if you want ongoing improvement, use fillers off the shelf to get the result better. So I use this analogy to have you understand this, which is the mattress. The fat is the deep foundation for the face. It changes your blink. Duvet, small little adjustments that are out there that can improve little areas, that's going to be fillers, okay? And then the sheets, the, the surface skin is going to be neuromodulators and skin resurfacing. So if you sort of break down the face into these compartments, you can do a better education for a patient. And I always say the difference between an education and an excuse is an education is told before and excuses afterwards. So let's talk about some strategies. So the cheek, really, minus the buccal area, is broken down. Oh, broken down into two areas, anterior and lateral cheek. I'm progressively placing less in the anterior cheek. And I believe the real problem is not necessarily the static cheek, it's the dynamic cheek. And that's something that we don't think about, which is we look at our patients, we take our photographs statically, but we don't engage them when they smile, and sometimes they can look too cheeky. And so where I feel it's safe to fill the cheek is the outer surface. So I typically now put a lot less fat into the anterior cheek and i actually much more aggressive on the outer cheek because it looks good static, it blends out the halo, reshapes, reshapes the face, and minimizes risk when you're talking about dynamic issues. So even when I do fillers, I'll have them smile, I'll look at it, and I'll engage them. And a lot of times what we do is, um, for me, the most important before and after is a frontal view. Why is that? Because that's how we engage socially, professionally with one another is from the frontal view. If we try to always take the side view, which is great surgically, but that's not how socially a person engages. So I'm looking for a frontal view, and now I'm looking more <coughs> dynamic issues because that's how we engage socially. The buccal area as a remembrance is very, very important because that's the area that transitions down. You got a very full face, put nothing there. Someone that's very empty, it's the, probably the most important area because if you fill this, you're gonna accentuate and make the lower buccal area look even worse. So the chin, I like to call it an upside down U. It's not the mental sulcus, and it is not jowl. It is a combination of all these ingredients. It is an arc that's, that goes over the bone and across here. This is why I do a lot of chin implants for microgenia, but I or to improve a facelift when they have a bad uh, ratio of bone to soft tissue, but I don't do 
uh, chins, chin implants to rejuvenate the face because what it does is it accentuates the bone in the front and it makes the sulcus or the region above the chin look hollower or shallower. And so that area, or deeper, excuse me, so that's an area that I'm looking to and what I'm doing is I'm shaping it. I'm not just looking for the recess to come forward, but what I'm looking for is, is am I making that person actually look better? So look for that arc there. And then all of this joins together to create that nice oval shape that I talk about. So the buckle area can be divided further into the central buckle. It can be, it's the area below the arch of the bone, which has become my new fascination in the last year and a half. And I really encourage you to look at that scalloping of bone on the edge. It's a fundamental area to make someone look good and, be, and have a really nice arc of a shape of a face. Changes the way you read a face completely. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. And then the, the medial buckle hollow, the risk you have with that area is that you can overfill this area. To me, I rarely do that. That's for someone that is much older, that has, uh, and it has loss of the, the dentition, and I may fill some there. But that's an area that I just look at the buckle area to me as a transition point between the mid and the lower face. What you're trying to do is soften transition points between various watershed areas of the face. So again, this is a lady that's too gaunt, so I'm going to fill and round that out. But this is a lady that doesn't need anything in the buckle area. If anything, I want to draw her face and make it narrower, and that's an important area. Same thing here. There's no buckle at fill. I've narrowed her face by filling it. So the framing of the eye, you've heard a lot about it today with a lo lot of philosophical, so psychosocial, and uh, technical ways of doing it. I'm just going to give you my spin. It's not to say this is better or worse. This is just my spin on it. And what I do is I take a lot from these lectures because there's so much, so many ways to do things right. And the goal is look at it, see if this works in your hands. There are a lot of good things that work in your hands that may not work in my hands and vice versa. This is a lady that I did a conservative upper eyelid skin removal with laser resurfacing of the lower eyelid and fat grafting. Is it a perfect result? No, but it's a better frame. So I like to look at the brow like a balloon that deflates. I use an upper blepharoplasty, which I do almost every week, but almost just by one a week, whereas I do a ton of filling of the brow as a support to the fill. It is rarely, if ever, the principal mechanism by which I rejuvenate a face. It is my support. And this is an example where I didn't take anything away. It's, to me, too vacuous. So I filled it in and framed down the face. This is a face I showed you before that, to me, is too excessive. There's too much of a steatoblepharon or eye bag, too much dermatochalasis. So this is um, upper, upper blepharoplasty, transconjunctival lower blepharoplasty, panfacial fat grafting, neuromodulator, and skin resurfacing. And I believe a little of all of these things together contribute to a better result. There's a lady that's had a brow lift, upper blepharoplasty, lower blepharoplasty. If anything, what I've done is I've pushed down the brow complex. I framed it down, not a lot, not to change her eye, but just to make it less bony. The less bone that you see and the less articulation of bone exposure, the softer I think the face can look. So let's break down further the eye frame and we're finishing here. So we've heard a lot about framing the eye. I want to break it down to the very small nuances of how I see an eye frame. So we're going to talk about an eye frame just stepwise in a stepwise fashion. So the lower eyelid, I break down into two areas. Why is that? Doesn't mean anything. It just means that I want to keep my numbers consistent as I build an eyelid. When I do fat grafting, you'll see this tomorrow in the surgery, I'm going to approach it deep because I don't want to see the fat. So a lot of people use fat as a filler and I really want to encourage you to look at fat as a bioactive soft treatment that is not going to correct everything that should be placed deeply rather than fill everything. So I just place it at the rim and I, I release some of the arcus marginalis and I go perpendicular to the frame of the eye and I never put in, never say never, but I rarely have ever put more than about three cc's in the lower eyelid, maybe four at most because I can always come back and micro finesse it with fillers. I'd rather not try to, try to hit 120%. 120% doesn't always look good. 80% looks good enough, and then I'll finesse it with fat, uh, fillers. So I'm looking at fat as a baseline fill, and, and you want to go perpendicular. Curiously, when I do fillers, I can go a little more superficial, depending on the filler I use, and I go parallel to the rim. And so this is a different technique, again, that's just a, a, a hint of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. But fat, perpendicular, release arcus marginalis, deep placement, don't get close to the ciliary margin, stay away keep safe, 
and don't go high volumes. This is just my vision. It doesn't mean it has to work for you. If you put in eight CCs and you get great results, power, more power to you. I'm just, I just don't uh, do that and I don't, I'm too scared to do it. So the nasal jugal groove is just basically a little soft tissue extension. I encourage you to place less there. Um, I only put in about a half a CC. I think this is an area that when you smile, it bunches. So place less in this area, although it's obviously a classic zone where we say put, 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 put. I'm saying pull back. Anything in the anterior upper cheek, bring down your volumes. Watch those volumes and always, always look at your volume replacement in a dynamic as well as a static state. Maybe a small pearl. Um, as I go out, when you approach a rim from a, from a lower vertical area, you're not going to hit the outer canthus. It's just, for, and I was missing this canthus in the first couple years of doing this. I've done fat now close to 10 years, nine and a half years. And, I, I, and I'm looking at these results in the first two years, I'm missing the canthus. So I look at, how do you approach it? How many entry sites? It doesn't matter. Whatever is easy, because it's, it's, it's a non-issue. You just want to have easy access. For me, when I look at the rim as a circular element, I approach it from three positions, perpendicular going to medial, perpendicular to the lateral, and then perpendicular to the rim going from the lateral canthus. How much do I put in? About half a cc. I may go up to one. I may go down to 0 0.2. I'm actually, and people always ask me, what's my end point? About 70% of this is memorized with a patient in the, in the waiting area as I think these are the numbers based on my experience I want to put in. It's corroborated with a photograph in the room, and it's only partially, like 20 or 30 percent, based on what I see as I fill. So just, if anything, be conservative. If you don't know how to release that arcus in the lower eyelid and you're scared, I didn't have this luxury almost a decade ago, but I would use HAs, and it's hyaluronic acids, and instead of using a hyaluronic acid the way that I, I tell you parallel, do it exactly like you do a fat graft. Release the arcus, put in three cc's of it or two cc's, get the motion down. And that's actually how I st did HAs for the first two or three years. I didn't know any better. I used a full cannula, I gave him a dental block and went and did that. But that's a way that you can practice and not worry about messing up the lower eyelids. Because I know everyone is going to ask me in the lab, how do I get away from all these terrible photos I see online of bumps and lumps? I can tell you in the almost 10 year history of doing this, I may have had one or two. And it, it, I remember cutting out one. I don't know why it happened, but it happens. Things happen when you do enough cases. But it's so rare that I'm not even, it's not even a, a major fear of mine on the consent form. Um, but try with HAs, that may help you as well. So if we get up to the upper eyelid, the lateral brow complex is really important. That highlight's really beautiful. My, my uh, colleagues, Mark and Rob Glasgow, came up with a really nice, I think, concept, which is a type one and a type two eyelid. What that is, is a type 1 eyelid, I can't remember which one's which, is, is a full frame, I believe may got backwards. Type 2 is an emptier frame. So not everyone has a huge full frame. Some people are born with a, a less full frame. Don't convert their eyelid. And if you have any question, where I really get the most benefit of looking at an old photograph is seeing how full their eyelid was. Just be, but you can usually tell, if they're very vacuous here, probably a good idea that their upper eyelid was fuller. You know, but don't overfill the eyelid. Look at where things were. And when you create that highlight, it's really nice. And we heard a lot about A-frame deformities. I like filling that if they need it and if they were full at that point. And then the other thing, as you saw in that Sharon Stone photo, is that where the bone of the orbital rim transitions to depression, okay, where you see the rim of the bone go down over like this. That is a very, very focused area that I, I look at when I'm doing fillers and fat. I'm hitting that transition. Why? Because that is why you know it's bone. When you see the bone cave inward, that is what makes you realize they're older. And so it's not just creating a highlight. It's looking at the shadow point transitioning down into the concavity that I want to soften. And so look for that as you fill a patient with fatter fillers. Um, and that's basically, oh, fi, sorry, one other area. So when I fill this whole eye, sometimes I see a little residual deficit. So I'll just fill that with maybe 0.2 to 0.5 cc's in, in that area. Um, so the eye frame is really important. I think we're, we're hollowing frames too much. And I do do blepharoplasties. I do do lasers. I don't do brow lifts anymore. Um, I, part of the reasons I don't get consistent lifts, I agree, it's very hard to get that lateral area lifted, and when I do, I don't like it. So in general, I just haven't done a brow lift for a long time, and if you're getting great brow lifts results, fantastic, please don't stop. So I encourage you, the final slide I always have in all my talks 
is to really think artistically, stop your, your technical brain for a brief moment and start to understand beauty because when we engage passionately with what is beautiful, we create beautiful work. Thank you.